I see how it all makes sense. My life sounds very winding and not only straightforward, but now looking back at the last few years, I see how God was preparing me for what I'm doing here and how he was guiding me and getting me in touch with the right people and um, helping me to learn the right lessons. As a parish priest, you have to be a little bit of everything. You have to be a psychologist at time, you have to be an architect, you have to be an engineer, an electrician, you have to be a musician, and uh, you have to be a public speaker, you have to be a father figure. And these are things I've learned over the many years as I prepared for the priesthood. born in Germany, I grew up in Germany, and my story until Ireland is already uh, quite long, for some people interesting, so I will speak a little bit about that. I grew up in Duisburg, which is an industrial town in Germany. It has about 500,000 inhabitants, which is a huge city by Irish standards. And um, the city is known mainly for its industry, uh, for its coal and steel production. And that's where my father worked. He worked as a clerk in a steel company, doing mainly desk work. And uh, my mother was a housewife. My mother was born and raised in a Lutheran family in the north of Germany. My father was um, raised in a family with a socialist background. So uh, my grandparents didn't care much to have their children baptized. My father is not baptized and he's still very critical towards religion, especially the Catholic religion. And my mother, she was uh, a cultural Protestant. She said she believed in God, but um, I never saw her praying and God wasn't very much um, a guest and a friend in our house. So uh, if I think about my family, I'm thinking about cultural Protestantism. And uh, my way to find God and to love, fall in love with God it's an interesting one, and looking back to my early childhood, I would say it's an act of providence. I was an adventurous child, and I liked to walk around in the neighborhood. And one afternoon, I wasn't even at school, I think I was about five years old. I went into one of the gardens in the neighborhood, which belonged to an elderly couple, and uh, they were um, amazed to see a young man just walking in and saying hello, but they were very friendly and very welcoming and uh, offered me something to eat, something to drink, and we had a chat and I liked them. So um, I went again a few days later and it turned out this uh, elderly couple were Methodist Christians, free evangelical as we would call them in Germany, and they were very faithful. They had a strong prayer life. They studied scripture every day. They went to church every week. And um, after a few times I started visiting them, they started reading to me from the children's Bible and uh, they became like grandparents to me and I really loved these stories from the Bible and uh, more, more reasons to go there and visit them. And uh... One day I learned there's a profession which is called a pastor or a minister and uh, it was explained to me, uh, he reads to people from the Bible and he talks to them about God. And it was clear to me, I wanted to be a pastor, I wanted to be a minister. So um, from that uh, day on, uh, I wasn't uh, even uh, at school when I learned about being a pastor. Uh, I told everyone, I will be a pastor one day. And so I went through uh, um, primary school. I went to secondary school in my hometown and got a um, good school education. I used to be a, a very religious child until the time when um, I was due to receive Protestant confirmation, which meant um, for two years I had to go to Bible classes and got to know Bible really well. And uh, I had a pastor at the time who was very strict, very anti-Catholic, and he gave us a very rigid and very strict understanding of Christianity, a very strict understanding of God who hated sin and only loved the good persons as it appeared to me. 
And when I reached puberty, I started asking myself questions and I asked, is this really, really the God of the Bible? Is this really a God I can believe in? And um, because I received a very anti-Catholic upbringing from my uh, from the elderly couple, from my parents, everyone in the family, my parish, my Protestant parish. Catholicism wasn't very much an option for me, so I started reading about other religions. I started um, reading about philosophy. I looked into Buddhism, I looked into Zen Buddhism, but nothing of that attracted me. So um, in the years about 15, 16, I was pretty much um, an agnostic. I decided uh, or I felt the decision whether God exists and how he exists couldn't be decided, intellectually at least. And um, so I lived on my life, uh, went through the teenage years. But then Easter 1992 came, and that was a, a very interesting time. Um, during the Holy Week and Easter week, there was a lot of religious programs on television. And there was one film that struck a chord in me. It's quite a kitschy film, it's an old film, but it's called Dominic the Singing Nun. You can look it up. And um, this kind of how Christians and how Christians were depicted as good people um, attracted me. And uh, it was the first time I learned about the Dominicans. But um, I didn't look any further. I was just impressed by this film. Year later, 1993 arrived, and I remember I walked by the Catholic church in the neighborhood, and I looked up the spire. And as in Germany, you often find a little um, rooster or a bronze cock on top of the spire. And I looked at it, and I felt a longing, and I said, "Lord, here I am. If you want me, um, uh, I belong to you. I'm willing to come back." And I felt an inspiration to just go around the corner knock at the door of the Catholic priest. We just got a new um, Catholic priest uh, in the area and I introduced myself and I said, well, my name is Frank and I would like to uh, look into the Catholic Church. And he said, well, sure, you're welcome to come to Mass and um, if you want, you can meet me from time to time. So that's what I did. I started going to Mass every Saturday and every Sunday. And I met him once a month and I asked him all the questions, well, why do Catholics worship idols? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why don't Catholics don't uh, understand the Eucharist is only symbolic and not um, uh, and not real, as you say? And we had a lot of debates, and I think I gave him a hard uh, hard life during <laughs> that time. But he gave me the right things to read and uh, brought me in contact with the right people to meet. And because I always wanted to be a pastor when I was younger the idea came back and occurred to me I could be a priest one day. So I spoke to him about that and he said, oh, you know, every convert wants to be a priest. But I was persistent and I still, I rediscovered my love to God. I rediscovered the love or I discovered the love for Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer. And I felt I wanted to follow him more strictly. I was a, an all or nothing person. So it was clear to me if I become a Catholic, I want to be a priest and I want to live a holy life. And then uh, Easter 1994, uh, Holy Easter, the Holy Week, my parish, I had a chat with my parish priest and he said, well, I think um, the time has come for you to become a Catholic. So he gave me confirmation uh, at the afternoon of Holy Saturday 1994 and then the Easter celebration 1994 I had my first Holy Communion in the Easter night and from that time on the Easter night always remained a very um, strong and very valuable point in my life. During that time there was still conscription in Germany so I joined the German army for one and a half years, from 1995 to 1997. And um, I did what I was asked. I put my vocation to the test and I opened myself up to other possibilities. I opened my up, myself up to the possibility to become a military uh, surgeon, to perhaps study medicine and become a physician because I was very good at science in school. But then we had um, the military pilgrimage to Lourdes in 1996 
and I found that few days, a very intense time, a very intense time of encounter with God, encounter with Our Lady. I spoke to priests from all over the world and I had a strong feeling, no, I should be a priest, I shouldn't remain in the army. So I studied theology very intensely and I learned the biblical languages. I looked into the history of the church. I looked into um, exegesis, the meaning of scripture and uh, the uh, origins of Christianity and so on. In 2009 came, I wasn't able to make a decision for the priesthood and if you can't say yes, it's a no. So I spoke with my uncle and I said, well, I worked in hospitals for so many years. I've seen enough people dying, I've seen enough people being sick. So, but I like the hospitality aspect about that. And my uncle used to work as a hotel manager and also as a wine expert, as a sommelier. And he said, well, Frank, with your background and your uh, brains, by no means you will end up in hospitality. Uh, but uh, how about wine? I said, well, as a theologian, I have a general interest in wine. I never thought about it. He said, well, why don't you go to business school, gain a qualification in business administration and try to find work in wine, in the wine business. And it seemed to be a reasonable idea. So I went to business school, um, got a crash course in business administration. And as part of that training, which took six months, I could also work as a, 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 at a winery uh, in sales. And um, my studies of theology and philosophy proved to be useful because I was able to improve sales numbers by 56% only within a few weeks. So I was offered the position of sales manager and uh, I didn't have time off. Uh, I had to work from the morning till the late evening and I had to travel around and I had to attend wine fairs and so on. And I started getting very tired. And one evening I was sitting in the office at nine o'clock and the office turned white and started spinning. And I decided, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. I have no intention to die of a heart attack aged 50. So I um, left the winery, left wine business. And of course I needed an income. So I activated my network. And I received a phone call from Ireland one day. They needed German speakers with a business background. So I um, thought, oh, Ireland is not bad. I could go there for half a year, improve my English and uh, gain a little bit of business experience, perhaps go back one day. But after a while, I felt home at Ireland. So I decided to stay and um, lived a good life here. So I applied for the priesthood um, in the Archdiocese of Dublin. I was accepted as a seminarian and was sent to Maynooth, that was 2015, and um, started my studies. Um, the question was whether I should be sent to Rome because I had a degree, I already had a master's in systematic theology, but it was actually my request to stay in Ireland and to um, learn more about the church in Ireland, um, parish life in Ireland and receive an Irish formation. So my wish was granted. I was sent to Maynooth, where I studied from summer 2015 to summer 2016. And the year 1516, it went through the media. It was a particularly difficult year. It was a particu particularly difficult time for me. I felt many, many memories of my seminary life in Germany came back. But it, I was in a different situation because by then I had learned my lesson that it is not about being one of them. I learned the priesthood is different. The priesthood is about being a servant, being a good shepherd, being there for the little ones who belong to Christ. And um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue my formation in Maynooth due to the circumstances. So I um, asked for the possibility to do um, a parish year. My request to do a parish year was granted. I went to Clondalkin, which is a parish not too far from here. And I was very warmly welcomed by the parish priest. And he um, 
And by the parishioners, he gave me an opportunity to get to know Irish life, Irish uh, parish, parish life, the realities of diocesan priesthood in a metro metropolitan parish. And I had a great year. I really enjoyed my life in Clondalkin. I really enjoyed whatever I could learn from uh, the priest who looked after me. He allowed me to stay in the parochial house and I could shadow him during that year. And I got a lot of positive feedback from the parishioners who confirmed me in my priestly vocation and in my decision to stay in Ireland. So I um, spoke with the Archbishop of Dublin and he uh, accepted me back into formation after the year out. I completed my studies in Rome, all went well. Um, I uh, completed everything within time. So I was sent back to uh, Dublin and my rector, who uh, accompany, accompanied me very well during these two years, and I'm very grateful to him for that. Uh, he told my Archbishop Frank is ready for ordination, so I returned to Dublin in September 2019. Um, I started um, a parish year in Selbridge. So Archbishop Martin ordained me a deacon in um, November uh, 2019 and he sent me to um, a very interesting parish, Selbridge, which is one of the largest parishes in the diocese and he um, sent me to be mentored by a very experienced priest who uh, tried to give me a gentle and yet good introduction into the priesthood into priestly ministry and so I started working as a deacon and did whatever a deacon is allowed to do. And uh, the day of my ordination came 2019. My friends, uh, they weren't really, really surprised that I found back to my priestly vocation. They always found some, some, something priestly in me. Uh, it seemed like people saw more in me than I saw in myself. Perhaps I just needed a little bit of encouragement. And everyone was looking forward to coming to Ireland in 2020 in order to uh, witness my the great day, uh, what I prepared for for so many years and over so many uh, detours. But then the pandemic started in the year uh, in uh, early in uh, 2020, and it changed a lot. Uh, my parish priest, priest in Selbridge, Selbridge, he wasn't of good health, so he started um, isolating himself, uh, uh, cocooning, they called it at that time, and pretty much whatever had to be done in the parish had to be done by the deacon, which uh, whatever is uh, allowed to do by a deacon. Obviously, I couldn't say mass, but I looked after a lot of funerals, and I looked after a lot of funerals under very difficult circumstances. People weren't allowed to gather. The first funerals I did was pretty much the coffin in the chapel, myself and the undertaker, and uh, perhaps people were allowed to join by a webcam if there was a webcam. Otherwise, it was a very strange experience and I had to learn to do the best. But also, it was like being thrown into the cold water and having to find my own way into ordained ministry without close accompaniment from the priest whom I was with. But anyway, um, numbers went down and uh, it looked quite good uh, in the summer months. So I spoke with Archbishop Martin and we found um, a suitable date for my priestly ordination. We um, agreed on the feast day of the Holy Cross. Over the years, I developed a great, great um, devotion to the Holy Cross. It's uh, one of the churches I attended in Rome a few times, Santa Croce. And I found it was a very appropriate day to put my life under the mystery of the cross. But uh, we still had the restrictions and only a very limited number of people were allowed into the cathedral and we couldn't have a great liturgy. Um, I could invite about 70 people. Half of them were priests, half of them were people whom I met over my time preparing for the priesthood in Ireland in the different parishes in, um, in uh, Clondalkin and in Selbridge. 
and we had to avoid the impression of concelebrating. So um, all the priests who attended were asked to wear a black suit and only a red stole registered the color of the day of the Holy Cross. And um, we had to be very careful how to celebrate the liturgy. We had to uh, observe all the hygiene uh, measurements. We were still under the impression of the pandemic. There were still lockdowns and a significant part of my first month uh, of being a priest. I couldn't really work um, as what a priest does. I couldn't, visit it. I couldn't visit houses. We didn't have celebrations like baptisms or First Holy Communions or confirmations due to the restrictions. We mainly had funerals and the daily mass, but I tried to make the best of the situation. I used what I learned in pastoral psychology to help to console the bereaved and help them through periods of mourning. And I used the spare time I had to write um, homilies and do so as some kind of a retreat talk to give the people who followed on the webcam something to think about, some spiritual food uh, and uh, some inspiration for the day. And um, I got a lot of positive feedback. Uh, people really enjoyed my homilies. They really enjoyed the thoughts and um, the pieces of food, of spiritual food I gave them. And that was my first month in the priesthood. And uh, eventually the, um, most of the restrictions were lifted. We could celebrate um, sacraments again, like First Holy Communions, Confirmations, uh, a sense of normality uh, returned to or entered into my priestly ministry. And much to my surprise, um, I wasn't even 20 months um, ordained. It was announced that I would be appointed to my first own parish. I was appointed parish administrator to the parish of Pilna Manor and Castle View, which is one of the smaller parishes, one of the smaller parishes and uh, a good parish to start. People welcome me very warmly here. And now I'm serving as parish priest here in this parish. not always an easy life, but it's a fulfilling life. And if you are there where Christ wants you, he gives you the help, gives you the energy you need in order to be a good shepherd. And if he wants you, he gets you. It took him more than 20 years to bring me to the point where I am now. But I can see he wanted to prepare me for this time. He wanted to prepare me for the challenges I'm meeting. And so even if you're older, don't be afraid. You have so much to offer. You have your gifts and the church needs these gifts. We need life experience. We need knowledge of the life of people. And if you are younger and you enter a seminary in your early 20s, the church will provide you with the um, skills and the knowledge you need. The church is very good at preparing priests. We have centuries and centuries of experience in that. Um, I can encourage, all I can do is encourage you to be trustful and trust yourselves into the hands of the priests who are guiding you. Learn to listen to the voice of God in the silence of your heart and God will give you the right answer and trust in the wisdom of the church. She will help you to discover your vocation and where God wants you in your life. Problems, worries, sadness, are you seeking solutions? Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Choose faith over fear.